I just realized that my microphone was off. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. So let me repeat the things you didn't hear me just say. I hope everybody's uh, getting is caught all caught up on your homework. The next test comes out pretty fast. We're actually going to finish the material for the next test on Wednesday, a week from today. And then all that will be left to do is review. So don't uh, don't let it you know catch you off guard. Make sure if, if you aren't caught up now, make sure you get all caught up over the weekend so that on Monday you have very little to do to be prepared for test two. We're going to start with questions. Let me, um, I'll put the camera on so that you'll be able to see. Um, that it just is a bit of a warning. Yesterday I had some issues with the camera. So if at any time, if at any time it, um, like the video disappears, uh, someone, get, can you turn on your microphone and tell me, okay? This happened multiple times yesterday. I'm hoping, I was having a bad internet day yesterday. In fact, it actually went down during the break in one of my classes. If that happens today, if the internet goes down and I'm not able to return after the break, if, or if that ever happens, I will try to put an announcement and send an email in my phone because my phone will still work even if I don't have my internet here at home. So I'll try to put that in my, uh, send you an announcement and email my phone. I will try, continue to try to get back on. I won't just give up, um, but I will understand if you don't want to just sit there and wait for me to get back on the internet. But another thing you can do is if I'm not there, I believe as long as the session is open, you can still talk to each other and talk about problems. Maybe you're going to work on some problems together. So that's a thing you could do if that ever happens. Happened to me yesterday, uh, about 10 minutes. It took me about 10 minutes into my uh, session, second session after the break before I was able to get internet back. So um, just to let you know, that's just the thing we have to deal with uh, doing the classes online. We're going to start today with questions that you have over 3.2. I keep thinking we're uh, further along than we are. But today, the new section is going to be 3.3, the addition rule. What we did on Monday was 3.2, which was the multiplication rule. So I have my math lab pulled up, so I'm ready to answer questions if you have any on 3.2. Um, if you're really stuck on something on 3.1, we could look at that as well. So uh, did anybody have any problems or issues with any of the questions in those first two sections of chapter three. Can everybody hear me? Sometimes I wonder when I don't get any answers. So if I yeah, ask you, you, what? I say, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thanks, Diamond. Um, if I ask a question, even if you just type in the chat, um, I'm good, I don't have any questions, or I don't know yet, or whatever. Anything you type in the chat, any feedback is really helpful. If you can picture standing in front of a class and asking them questions, or in front of people and asking them questions, and you're trying to help them, but you're not, nobody's saying anything to you, then that's why I asked you if you could hear me, okay? So even if your answer is no, or I don't know, that's fine. Type away in the chat. I don't care. Lots of chat. That would be that would be good. And plus, it gives everybody else makes it a little more interesting for everybody else. Okay. So if you don't have questions on three two, then let's go on to section three point three. So three point three is called the addition rule. And there's some things, this is a similar but different. It's a, it's a rule for probability. It's a rule for probability that we use in certain situations, just like we use the multiplication rule in certain situations. 
So I, I would like to review that multiplication rule and then we'll get into the addition rule. So this is also for probability. And this is the new topic that we're going to learn today. Now, just to review the multiplication rule that we got last time. So let's put review 3.2 so that we could kind of compare the two and know when to use which rule. The multiplication rule was a rule used to find the probability of A and B. And this was when you have sequential events occurring. So a couple of notes we want to make where A and B are sequential events, meaning one happens and then the next, one after another. A happens, then B happens. So what you're looking for, if we're looking for the probability that A and B happen, then you take first the probability that A happens. So that's just a normal probability. And then when you see the word and, that's your indication that you're going to, the operation you're going to use is multiplication. So when I see the word and, the operation I'm going to use is multiplication. And then for the second part, you do the probability that B is going to happen, but when you do that, you assume so you could kind of think of that. I told you to think of this line as given. If you want to, you could also think of it as the word assuming that A already happened. Okay? So that straight line means given. I'll give you a couple of words that you can use for it. You can think of it as given or on the condition. So A is the condition. Um, instead of giving, I hadn't thought of this before, but you could say assuming that A has happened. So this is a condition. And so we might put here that has already happened. We're assuming A has already happened. And what we saw from a few problems on Monday was that often that condition, when you're doing, con this is called conditional probability, and often when you're doing conditional probability, the condition narrows your sample space. Because whatever this is, you're assuming it's already happened, and so you're only look at, looking at whatever is left. So, for example, if we already know for selecting a card from a deck of cards, and we already know that the first card drawn was red. Okay? So assuming then the probability of B, given that the first card was red, then that changes our sample space. That means there's one fewer red cards. Um, and we looked at charts. There are a lot of charts that they give you in the problems. And like if your condition is that you're only looking at females, so it's given. So the first thing you know is what they might ask, what's the probability they have this degree given they are female? Then that means you're only, you already know they're female, so you only look at the females, and then you look at the number that got a particular degree. So that condition here, this condition, is a thing that's already happened, and it narrows your sample space. Okay. So one of the definitions we got last time that is related to this 
is independent versus dependent events. So if A and B happen to be independent, like one does not affect the other, then this condition here just becomes the probability of A because, I mean, the probability of B, because if they are independent, it won't matter at all if A has happened or not. So we had that concept of dependent and independent. And um, so with the multiplication rule, so we could say here that if A and B are independent events, independent, I'm sorry, I'm having a, I'm having a bad spelling day here, independent, that needs to be a D, independent, just, I can't remember if that's an A or an E, independent, that looks, I can't remember, so if A and B are independent events, would someone check on that and make sure I spelled that right, I hate spelling things wrong, then the probability of A and B happening sequentially is just the probability of A times the probability of B. So notice if they're independent, then that condition doesn't do anything and you, you can just drop it. It doesn't hurt for it to be there because it doesn't do anything, but you can just drop it. So this was the multiplication rule we talked about last time. Did y'all look up and make sure I spelled independent correctly? Did anybody look it up for me? Okay, thank you guys. Spelling's kind of a big deal to me. So I know I'm a math person, but I hate it when I spell things wrong. So uh, I don't know why I thought it was an A to start with. So anyway, so this is what we did on Monday. Today we're going to pick up a new rule, the addition rule. And just as the multiplication rule works when you see the word and, the addition rule is going to work when we see the word or. Now we have a couple of definitions we need to learn in order to understand the rule, this addition rule. So the first thing with um, the addition rule, being independent or dependent doesn't really matter. Uh, for one thing, when you do an or probability, it isn't necessarily sequential events. It might just be one event, okay? So the multiplication rule, this is kind of a big thing for you to understand. This uh, multiplication rule applies when you have sequential events. So the addition rule applies to, it, it's just one event usually. It can be sequential, but it doesn't have to be. So first we have a definition we need to pick up. And that definition is the definition of mutually exclusive events. This is a, a slide out of the PowerPoint for 3.3, which is in your 3.3 media. So you can look up the slide later. But this is something you need to know, and you need to be able to determine if two events are mutually exclusive or not. Just like in 3.2, remember, if you've done any of it, then you saw several questions that asked you if events were independent or dependent. In 3.3, you're going to have questions that ask you if two events are mutually exclusive, right? So let's look at what mutually exclusive means. Events are mutually exclusive when they cannot occur at the same time. That's what mutually exclusive means. Another way to say that is that they have no outcomes in common. 
If they have no outcomes in common, we call them mutually exclusive. Here they have a picture of two uh, of events A and B that are mutually exclusive and events A and B that are not mutually exclusive. So imagine this sample space here, and I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, imagine this whole sample space and everything in the sample space. And I'll give you an example real quick of, uh, let's say that our event, I'm going to make one up, okay? So let's say that we are rolling a die. For example, so our entire sample space would be, and often they'll do the sample space, all the numbers in the sample space would be the numbers one through six. On this first picture, an example of an A and B that are mutually exclusive would be, uh, say, event A is rolling an even, and event B is rolling an odd. Since there are no numbers that are both even and odd, a and B do not overlap. There's no overlap. There's nothing in common. There are no numbers that are both even and odd. So we would say those two events are mutually exclusive. That's different than independent. Independent is when you have separate or sequential events and the probability of one does not affect the probability of the other, like rolling a die and flipping a coin. They are, mute. they are independent because what you roll on a die does not affect what you flip on a coin. Here, we're imagining that we roll the die once, and we're talking about the probability of get, getting an even number or an odd number. And those two events are mutually exclusive. They have no outcomes in common. There's no overlap. There are no numbers that are both even and odd. And that would be an example of mutually exclusive. Okay, let's think of an example where they're not mutually exclusive. So for the second one, so these are two separate examples. So this was example of mutually exclusive. Let's look at an example of two events. We'll use the same sample space where they're not mutually exclusive. So maybe A is still rolling an even, and B is getting a number less than five. Then do you see that within A, you would have the numbers two, four, and six, right? 2, 4, and 6, and I could put them in A. 2, 4, and 6 would be in A. Wait a second. I'm going to erase that one because that's not where I want it. Oh. Two, four, and six are in A. One, two, three, four are in B, which means there are two outcomes that are in both A and B. So the number two is in both events, and the number four is in both events. The number six is out here. It's in A, but it's not in B because it's even. 
but it's not less than five. And over here in B, we would have one and three, and those would be events that are in B, but not in A. But notice that there are two numbers, the numbers two and four, that are both even and less than five. In other words, the two sets overlap. These two events, A and B, have at least one outcome in common. In fact, these two events have two outcomes in common, the numbers two and four. And so because they have outcomes in common, they are not mutually exclusive. You see, not. So when you have outcomes in common, then you do not have mutually exclusive events and there's an overlap. Okay, so keeping that in mind, we're going to look now at the addition rule. And I'm gonna leave this up here for just a little bit so that if you want to write down these two examples of events that are mutually exclusive and events that are not mutually exclusive in the picture, I'm gonna give you a few minutes here to copy that down before we go on. While you're doing that, I'm going to check roll. So I want you to write down this definition and draw this picture of it if you want to. And I'll call your name, raise your hand, and leave it up when I call your name. Uh, Ariana. Cecil. Diamond. Kayla Kendra Christina Layla Mia Ricky Samira, okay, Stephanie, and Ariana, are you there? Raise your hand if you're there, Ariana. Okay, great. Okay, you guys can put your hands down. Thank you very much. Before we go on, does anybody have a question about mutually exclusive events? Okay. If you watch the PowerPoint, it will also it will give you, I think it has a few more examples, but you can also look in the textbook. So that's when you go to the media assignments, you will always see a PowerPoint a video, and a textbook. Don't forget that you have those resources. All right. So now we're ready. We're going to look at the multiplication rule. I'm sorry, the addition rule.
And while you're looking at this, notice this is a PowerPoint slide number nine, in case you want to look at it later. And I'm going to write it up here for you, too. Kayla, do you have a question? Or Chloe? Hi, this is the other interpreter. Can you hear me? Yes. Is your name Karen? Yes, this is Karen. We've been having some difficulties with uh, technology on our end uh, today. Okay. Um, and right now we're seeing that our our Zoom session is ending in six minutes. Okay. Um, and we don't really know why our Zoom session is uh, has a limited time. Yeah. Um, I don't I would I don't know that either. Um, I would definitely check with uh, I, I think her name is Olivia. Isn't that right? Um, uh, would it be possible? What do you think about starting it once it ends? Can you start a new session or do you know? Uh, hang on just a second while we uh, discuss that. I, I don't know the uh, that we can. I'm relying on Chloe on it and we're having just some difficulties today. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for the interruption. I have been getting all of, I don't know if you guys knew this, but I have been getting all of my lectures closed captioned. And when I upload them in, in my math, in my stat lab, then anybody who wants to can turn on the captions, the closed captioning. So that is available to the students. Um, so if something goes wrong, there is that option. Hopefully um, you guys can work this out, but I, I'm only involved with the Blackboard collaborate part of it, so I, I really can't, I can't, I'm not of much use to help you with the Zoom part of it. So uh, okay. let me know if you need to do anything in particular, okay? Okay, thank you for that information. We'll let her know and uh, we'll figure out the Zoom stuff. I'm pretty sure we could probably all log back in and restart the timer, but we just wanted to make sure that you were understanding of what's uh, occurring currently. Yeah, if you guys um, will stay on the collaborate or if one of you will stay on the collaborate session during the break, let's I have some some thoughts of, of something you might do. OK. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Sure. OK, everybody, let's look at this addition rule for the probability of A or B. So do you see here? that this rule applies if you have A or B. Remember the multiplication rule applied for A and B. The addition rule is used when it's the probability of A or B. Then that means that the operation you're going to use is addition. So let's make note of that, that if, it's, if you're going to use addition when you see the word or. So, and here's the rule. The probability of A or B and this is the main one you need to know. This is on your formula sheet, by the way. You do not have to memorize. You do not have to memorize the multiplication or the addition rule. They are on your formula sheet. So write this formula down because you will need this. Chloe or Karen, did you guys have a question? I'm sorry, thank you. Sure. Christina, do you have a question? Okay. 
So look at this rule. Ignore the bottom part for right now. And it says the probability of A or B occurring is equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Let's talk about that part of it for just a minute. So let's look at this right here, this probability of A and B. Remember how we just looked at the mutually exclusive events and you saw that sometimes if they were not mutually exclusive, that they would have outcomes in common. So when you're doing the probability of A or B, you can just add the probabilities, the two probabilities, but if they have any outcomes in common, in other words, if they are not mutually exclusive, then you have counted some outcomes twice. If there are any outcomes in both events, you know, like the two and the four, there were two outcomes in common. If there are any outcomes in common, then when you did the probability of A and the probability of B, when you did those two probabilities, there might be things you counted twice if they are not mutually exclusive. If you've counted something twice, then you have to subtract it off, and that's where this part comes in. And I'm going to do an example with you. This isn't hard, and you, it's generally easy to determine if they have things in common. Now, if they are mutually exclusive, if they don't have anything in common, then there aren't any outcomes that are in both. And if there are no outcomes in both, so if they are mutually exclusive, then notice the rule changes. Or you don't have to do the minus part. But you only don't have, the only time you leave the minus part off is if they are mutually exclusive. That's when you get to leave the minus part off. So if they are not mutually exclusive and really instead of thinking of the word mutually exclusive think of it as if there are outcomes in both events I've got to subtract them off however many there are if there are no outcomes in both events then there's nothing to subtract off and so you just add the two probabilities let me show you an example of this So here's the first example. This is actually an example in the PowerPoint. And the experiment is listed at the top. And here's the experiment. We're selecting a card from a standard deck. Notice that that's just one event. It says find the probability that the card is a four or an ace. Find the probability that the card is a four or an ace. So notice how they wrote the probability right here. The probability of getting a four or an ace. So we're just drawing one card. This is one event, not sequential events. One event, we want to know what's the probability we draw a four or an ace. So what they've shown here, this thing, this kind of picture is called a Venn diagram. And it shows the whole sample space is all 52 cards. And you can see the green circle. Those are your fours. And the blue circle shows your aces. And there's no overlap because there are no cards that are both a four and an ace. That doesn't exist. So that means fours and aces are mutually exclusive events. So notice here they point out that these events are mutually exclusive because you can't have a card that's a four and an ace. 
Because they are mutually exclusive, there's no overlap, no outcomes in common, which means we don't have to subtract off. There's no overlap to subtract off. Okay, Christina, do you have a question? So, since there are no outcomes to subtract off, notice how we do the probability. That word or tells us we're going to add. Or means add. Kind of get that in your head. In probability, or means add and means multiply. Or means add and means multiply. Write that down in your notes. Oh, yeah, I, I can just barely hear you. Let me see if I have my, maybe I have my sound down. Let me turn it back up. No, I have it up. I can just barely hear. No, I'm sorry. I'm having all kinds of technical difficulties. Okay. I'm sorry. That was like me yesterday. It was really frustrating. I was exhausted. I was exhausted. <laughs> so what I want you to write down is that or means to add. When we see or, and when we see the word and, that means to multiply. Now you do also have to remember that when you're adding, you're gonna have to subtract something off if there's overlap. And I have another example for you in just a minute where there's overlap. These two events, Fours and aces have no overlap. You can see from the picture that they don't overlap. There's no cards. There is not even one card that is both a four and an ace. That would be a super weird card. Not in a normal deck for sure. So because there's no overlap, that means if we were going to subtract off, so really it could be, it could look like this. We could be subtracting the probability that it's a four and an ace. They didn't put that on there. Now the reason why they didn't put it on there is because there aren't any. So that would be 0 out of 52. So since there are no cards, 0 cards that are both a 4 and an ace, we don't have anything to subtract off. So they chose to leave it off. But notice it doesn't hurt if I still do it. And my recommendation is that you always put that minus on it so that you don't forget to look for that overlap, to look to see if there's an overlap. On this one, there is not. See, they're totally distinct. There is no overlap. So that means I have no outcomes in common, zero nothing to subtract off so all I have to do is add the 4 over 52 plus 4 over 52 which gives us an answer of 8 over 52 and they changed this to a decimal but if I asked you for a fraction you would not leave it as 8 over 52 because that will reduce so if my stat lab tells you to change it to a decimal this one looks like it's been I don't know if it's been rounded. I'm going to check and see. So when you do 8 over 52, yeah, that's been rounded to three places. If you were going to take the test for me, or I may select problems where it wants the fraction form. So make sure you know how to do both forms. So this 8 over 52 answer would not be complete if they tell you to reduce it, so I'm going to reduce it over here. If I leave that probability in fraction form, I would divide by 4 on the top and the bottom, or you can divide by 2 and then divide by 2 again. So if you were to divide by 2, it would give you 4 over 26, 
and that would reduce to 2 over 13. That would be our final fraction answer, 2 over 13. And then if they tell you to round to three places, then this is your final answer. So the point 154 is a rounded decimal answer. The 2 over 13 is an exact reduced fraction answer. Now I'm going to do another one in just a minute, but I'm going to leave this up so you can look at it and make sure you understand everything about this example. So guys, look at the look at the experiment again. Think about why there, these two events are mutually exclusive. Notice how the probability is written. Notice how the formula is applied, because if I asked you to show work on this one, I would want to see this right here. If I, I would want to see this whole thing right here if I asked you to show work. Now, you wouldn't necessarily have to have the minus part because there is an overlap. There, is, there are no outcomes in common, but if you included it, that would be really good because even though this one doesn't need it, you should always write that part down so that you don't forget to do that when it is needed. We're going to do an example in a minute of when it of one where it is needed. Any questions before we go on? I know I've kind of made a mess of this slide. Hopefully you can tell what I did. Okay, let's look at another example. So this is example two. It says you roll a die. Find the probability of rolling a number less than three or rolling an odd number. So I, I wanted you to look at just the picture on this one first because they show the entire sample space on this one. So you see the numbers. Let me see if this will show up. If I use this color. Do you see all of the numbers are there in the sample space? One, two, I'll use my pointer. One, two, three four, five, six. That's the entire sample space. So if you were going to type that, it would be you'd have capital S. And I don't have braces available to me here, but um,
I didn't need that last comma. That's the whole space. If you think of these two things as events, maybe event, it says, uh, it says a number less than three or rolling an odd number. So your two events here are less than three. And the other event is rolling an odd number. So you see on the pink circle, maybe we call that event A. I'm sorry. And the blue skull is event B. And when we write the probability statement, it would look like this. I would write it like this. Number less than three or an odd number. That's like your A and your B. Now, I'm going to put this up on the board in just a minute. And then after the break, we're going to come back and do more examples from the homework. So on this one, look at A and B and see how they drew the picture. So you can see the numbers that are odd are all in the blue circle, 1, 3, and 5. Those are your odd numbers. The numbers that are less than 3 are just 1 and 2. Notice that, notice that the number 1 is in both because it's both odd and it's less than three. It's in both sets. That's one outcome. So these events have one outcome in common. Because they have one outcome in common, the probability of both, so if you said A um, and B, is 1 out of 6. That's the probability of A and B, because that's the probability that the outcome of rolling the die was both odd and less than 3. One outcome. Not because it's the number one, but because there's one number that's in both sets. One outcome in common. So I'm going to do this one on the board so that you can see, because I've also I've kind of run out of space on this picture. This picture is really nice, but can only see so much. So on this one, we're doing the probability, I'm going to transfer this to the board, of getting a number less than 3 or an odd number. So I'm going to stop sharing this so I can show you what I've written on the board. So I want you to look down here, this part. Here's our addition rule, the probability of A or B 
is the probability of A plus the probability of B because or means add. But then you have to subtract off the overlap. Notice I've subtracted off this. And I'm going to have something there if there are outcomes in common. In other words, if they are not mutually exclusive. If they are not mutually exclusive, then there's an overlap. And the way you get this probability, you're not going to use this AND formula to get that probability. I think a lot of people get confused because they think they have to use this AND formula. You don't have to use the AND formula to get this probability. So we're not going to use this up here when we're doing, when we're using the OR formula. All we're going to do to get this AND probability is we're looking for the overlap. So you're going to do the number of outcomes in common and divide by the total number of outcomes. So let me show you how we're going to apply this. Remember our picture? I'm going to go ahead and kind of represent that picture. Here was our sample space, the whole sample space. And then we had here. These were our numbers that were, I think they put the odd ones here, and these were the numbers less than three. So we had one outcome in common, the number one was odd and less than three. Then we had three and five over here. And then we had the number two over here. And then four and six were out here because they weren't, those aren't odd or less than three. So those numbers were out here in the sample space, but not in either of these particular sets. Now I'm going to show you how to use this picture, and we're going to use this formula here. So this is like our A and B. separated by the word or. So first, I'm going to write this in words first, and then we'll do the numbers. So I'm going to follow my formula. And you should always write your formula down, because it helps a lot. So notice I identified what event A is and what event B is. I also have a picture. This was, this is event B. And this is event A, because A is less than 3. So when I see probability of A, that's going to be the probability I get a number less than 3. So that becomes this. Plus the probability of B, B is getting an odd number. Minus the probability that it's both less than 3 and odd. In other words, this is the overlap. On our picture, it's the number of outcomes that are in both sets, A and B. Now, do these probabilities. Guys, this is the important part right here. People always want to skip this step because it's a little bit of writing. But if you do this, then the numbers are easy and the answer is easy. The important thing is to get this step written right here. That's the important thing. And the way I got that step is by following this formula based on my knowledge of what how many things are in an event A. So if you look and look if you look at A, there's only two things in event A, one and two. So A has two outcomes. 
B has one, two, three outcomes. In the whole sample space, we have six total outcomes. One more thing to make note of is that right here in this overlap, one outcome in common. Now I'm spent, I know I'm spending a lot of time on this one problem, but I'm hoping it'll help you understand what we're doing and how we get these probabilities. So now I'm actually going to put the numbers in. When you jump straight to the numbers, guys, that's fine, but it doesn't really demonstrate that you know what you're doing. If I ask you to show your work on one like this, I'm going to expect to see this formula written and followed. So practice what you would do on the test. Take your time and figure it out. So this first one says, what's the probability you get a number less than three? Okay, here are my numbers less than three. There are two outcomes, one and two. Two outcomes that are less than three. So that's two out of six. Six is going to be our denominator for every probability because that's the total number of possible outcomes. And I have plus. The probability of getting an odd number. So look over at our odd numbers here. There are three outcomes, one, three, and five, three different outcomes. So the probability of rolling an odd number is three out of six. Then we do have an overlap. So we need to, we need to include the subtraction part because there's an, at least one outcome that's in both sets. In fact, there's exactly one outcome. There's only one number that's both odd and less than three, and that number is the number one. Now, we're using the one here because that's one outcome, not because it's the number one, okay? So because there's one outcome in that overlap, so do you notice how I wrote overlap right here? There's one outcome in, that's in the overlap area. My denominator is always six. In other words, one outcome out of the six is in both sets. Let me show you another way to look at this. So I'm going to do the odds. I'm going to underline them in red. Notice there are three of them, three odd numbers. That's where the probability. That's why the probability of getting an odd number is three out of six. Now, the numbers that are less than three. The ones that are less than three are this one and this one. I'm going to circle those. I underlined the odds. I'm going to circle the ones that are less than three. There's two of them. So that probability is two out of six. That's where this came from. Now, how many outcomes have both a circle and a red line under it? Have both. You see, it's just one. There's only one number. That's where we get this. The probability that a number is less than three and odd. There's only one of them that meets both of those requirements. Those two events are not mutually exclusive because they do have overlap. They do have outcomes in common. It's only one, but that's all it takes. And I counted that one there in both of these, so I have to subtract it off once, that one outcome. If they had two outcomes in common, I would subtract two over six. Now, your denominators are all the same. All you have to do is add and subtract across the top. So I have 2 plus 3 is 5, minus 1 is 4 out of 6. And that would be my fraction answer, but I would reduce it. 
I've run out of room. If I divide by two, that means the probability in fraction form of getting either a number less than three or an odd number when rolling the die one time, not two different events, just I'm rolling the die one time, the probability of me rolling a number less than three or an odd number is two thirds. If they asked you to round this, they wanted an approximate answer in decimal form, and I'm going to round this to three places like, because probability is often rounded to three places. Two thirds is going to be repeating sixes, so this would end up being 0.667, and that would be the rounded decimal probability to three places. I'm going to leave this up. We're going to go ahead and have the break. I'm going to leave this up, though. So if any of you would like to, uh, if there's part of it you want to look at for a little bit longer, um, or if, I don't know, maybe the picture helps you better, but maybe this helps you more, you know, circling some and underlining others. When it's a huge sample space, this is harder. So if you're looking at the whole deck of cards or the sample space with the, with the pair of dies, that's a much bigger sample space. Those I have for you on that uh, sample space handout that's in the Unit 2 folder under Lessons. So don't forget to print that out. That will be helpful both on the homework and on the next test. So it's not always easy to draw it or write it out. So um, sometimes you have to think through it. But we're going to do some more examples after the break. I have about five examples out of the homework that I want to do with you. So be sure and come back after the break. We will meet back at 12.